So let, uh, I think time is, uh, is to start, so uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Benoit Charbonneau. I'm a professor in pure mathematics here at the University of Waterloo. This event has been organized by the Faculty of Mathematics. And welcome to all of you. I know that uh, I see some familiar faces, but uh, there are some few people here that don't quite look like they're university students um, uh, or uh, to be affiliated with the university. So welcome. I uh, hope you'll enjoy your evening. And if you do, the, the Faculty of Mathematics uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of public events, uh, but we do have uh, some once in a while. And uh, let me mention another one. Uh, on Friday, there's a joint um, project between the Faculty of Mathematics, the Faculty of Art, and St. Jerome's University. There'll be a, a bridge lecture about dancing the math of complex systems. But anyway, our speaker tonight is uh, Hubert Lois Bray, who was born in uh, 1970 in Houston, uh, named as for, after his grandfather, Hubert Evelyn Bray, who was also a mathematician. And in 1988, he was a member of the six-person United States team that competed at the International Mathematical Olympiad, where he received a bronze medal. After graduating in mathematics and physics from Rice, he received his PhD in mathematics from Stanford in uh, 1997. Professor Bray uses differential geometry to study black holes, dark matter, and the curvature of space and time. He is well known for his 1999 proof of the Riemannian Penrose conjecture for any number of black holes, as well as many other results in geometry and general relativity. More recently, he has used geometry to propose a model of dark matter, which makes up most of the mass of our galaxy. And I think you're going to talk about this tonight a little bit, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, and in his 2010 paper, he used simulations of galaxies to show how his model of dark matter wave, called wave dark matter, predicts the spiral patterns observed in galaxy, a mystery since their first observation in 1845. This is not easy thing. And so we're very, I mean, I'm just giving you a little bit of his CV here so you know that this is someone we're really happy to, uh, that he accepted our invitation and come here to talk to you. Professor Bray has been National Science Foundation postdoc at Harvard. He's been an associate professor at MIT, an associate professor at Columbia, and uh, he's currently a full professor of mathematics and physics at Duke University. So some, for those of you in academia, that's uh, something that impressed us. Maybe for those of you that are not in academia, maybe more impressive is the fact that he is married and the father of three boys and two daughters. <laughs> and he, uh, it's not the first time that Professor Bray uh, is uh, spending some of his time to try to impact the youth. He's, uh, every week he's working with teenagers at the Emily K. Center in uh, Durham, North Carolina, where he's uh, helping, teaching them a little bit of math just for fun. And so it's very natural that he should be speaking uh, today, and uh, he's going to talk about Pythagoras to Einstein, the geometry of space and time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Benoit, for that very kind introduction, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk today. So uh, certainly talking about the uh, uh, mathematics and physics is uh, something I really enjoy, so I hope uh, we have a lot of fun here today. <clears throat> so uh, here are some quotes by some notable uh, people connecting uh, you know, geometry and the universe. And you know, it's, it's, it's worth uh, noting that, you know, trying to understand the universe is a fundamental question, right? As Carl Sagan says, you know, we know we're approaching the greatest of mysteries. And I, I want to talk, focus on a, one little part of that mystery, which is known as special relativity today. So I'm going to describe to you one of Einstein's great achievements, which is the unification of space and time. And this, this is one of, of, of mankind's great uh, accomplishments. So, my story begins with uh, Pythagoras and Euclid, uh, two ancient Greeks who made a huge impact uh, on our understanding of, of mathematics. Uh, one thing that's, uh, of course, Pythagoras is known for the rule of Pythagoras, among other things. Um, I'm, uh, but a, another very, very important uh, ancient Greek would be uh, Euclid, who had this idea that we should study precisely what we're assuming, and uh, those are called axioms, and how you can try to minimize the number of axioms that you have and prove as much as you can with them. And so sort of the systematization of what a proof means uh, goes back to, uh, to Euclid. And so let's go ahead and start with the rule of Pythagoras. <clears throat> Very often you've heard it as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 
Uh, what I would like to do is since, uh, for those of you who haven't see, uh, heard of the rule of Pythagoras, uh, this is what it is. For those of you who have heard of it, I want to use a slightly different notation. I want to use dx and dy for the sides of the triangle, and I want to use ds for, this, for that uh, longest side, the side of the hypotenuse. And so the rule of Pythagoras tells us you that the hypotenuse squared, uh, ds squared, is equal to the sum of the, uh, is dx squared plus dy squared. So for example, 3 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared gives you a 3, 4, 5 right triangles I have on, on, the, on the board. And in fact, you can generalize the rule of Pythagoras to three dimensions, not just two dimensions. And when you do that, then you find that uh, if we have a vector and it has coordinates dx, dy, dz, that means we're going to go over dx in the x direction. We're going to go over dy in the y direction and then up dz in the z direction. That's what those coordinates mean. Then first you can compute what h is using the rule of Pythagoras. h squared is dx squared plus dy squared. And then you have another right triangle right here. And so h squared plus dz squared equals ds squared. And when you put it all together, you get ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. So we can call that the three-dimensional rule of Pythagoras. And in fact, you can keep on going. You can go to the fourth dimension if you like. Uh, now, that we can't visualize in the four dimensions. Our, our brains just don't work that well. If I wanted to intimidate you, I could say, well, I've learned how to visualize in four dimensions, but that would be a lie. All right, but you couldn't prove I was wrong. I could, you know, stick to that. Um, you know, we have various, you know, mechanisms we use in our brain of how we can visualize the four, fourth dimension. But one way to do it is just draw everything as three-dimensional and pretend like it's four-dimensional. All right. Um, but the point is, algebraically, everything works out the same. All right. We can notice patterns, and so this is why it's important not just to understand things with pictures. You can understand things with algebra, and that allows you to talk about any number of dimensions. So in four dimensions, ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared plus dt squared. Now, you might notice I've been provocative here. I've had my coordinates named x, y, z, and now t, right? And you're probably thinking, oh, t for time. And you'd be right. But sure, and you probably heard people say that time is the fourth dimension. On the other hand, that probably hasn't been fully satisfying, right? Because when you look at space, you can see it, for example. You can visualize it. What is time, right? It's something we can't really visualize as easily. Clearly, there's something different between space and time. So to unify them and to say time is the fourth dimension, well, I don't know. I mean, right, there's clearly something different. What is that difference? And it turns out that difference is we want to put a minus sign there in the rule of Pythagoras. Okay, so we're going to have a rule of Pythagoras now where you have a vector, and instead of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared plus dt squared, we're going to put a minus dt squared. Now, you might be wondering, wait a second, you just can't do that. I mean, the rule of Pythagoras was something we computed. Why all of a sudden you just change a plus sign to a minus sign? Well, it comes back to our axioms. These are axioms that Euclid would have discussed. We just changed our axioms. Instead of assuming the axioms of Euclid, we're going to go ahead and make this an axiom. All right, that's our axiom. That's how you measure the lengths of things. And it turns out that gives you a geometry. Now, the fact that you're allowed to do this is a non-trivial thing. All right? To introduce that minus sign, on the one hand, it's completely trivial. I just changed a plus sign to a minus sign. On the other hand, this is a genius move. <laughs> all right? no, I mean, the first um, people to realize that you might want to do this, I would guess, I and mean, it's hard to determine exactly, I would guess Gauss and Riemann were aware of the fact that you could do this. They probably weren't so sure why you'd want to do this. But Gauss would have been like, well, sure, I guess you could do it if, if you really wanted to. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know. I think that'd be an interesting historical fact to, to try to research what Gauss thought on this subject and what Riemann, they would have said, sure, you can do it if you want. But Gauss was a genius. His student Riemann was a genius. So this is a stroke of genius to put that minus sign right there. Now, once you've done that, by the way, special relativity is simply studying the geometry of this space. We're done. That's special relativity. All right. Now, you've probably seen special relativity with all these complicated formulas and boosts and this and that and the speed of light and it's very confusing and complicated. But if you really boil special relativity down to its most fundamental nature, it's just introducing that minus sign. Uh, and now we've unified space and time, x, y, and z, and t are two, aspects, two sides of the same coin. It's just that x, y, and z have plus signs in front of them and the t has a minus sign in front of it. And so uh, Gauss and Riemann 
were really influential in, in letting us realize that you could talk about arbitrary uh, metrics and in particular put in a minus sign. And so before we study the, the, the geometry of special relativity, let's just talk about what Gauss and Riemann did. What they realized is that if you want to understand the geometry of a, of a sphere, for example, like the surface of the Earth, that what you can do is you can flatten it out into a two-dimensional map. And so is the, Earth, is the surface of the Earth two-dimensional or is it three-dimensional? And what they realize is that intrinsically it really is only two-dimensional. You can go up and down, you can go left and right, you know, north, south, east, west. There are two different directions you go on the surface of the Earth. And so that you really you can understand it with two-dimensional maps. And in fact, that's how we think of the surface of the Earth. Right? If I want to, wanted to drive from North Carolina to come up here to Canada, uh, I would get a bunch of maps out. And I, when I went off the top of one map, then I would come back on the bottom of another map, right? And a bunch of series of maps would allow me to figure out how to drive from point A to point B. And in fact, that's how we can understand the surface of the Earth is a bunch of maps. And so here's uh, one such map. This is the map of the United States and part, little parts of Canada, I guess. And when we take something that's intrinsically curved, like the surface of the Earth, and then you try to flatten it out, what happens is, is that distances change. So for example, these are actually shortest distances between two points. If you want to go from Salt Lake City to um, Washington, D.C., the shortest path between two points is not this straight line like this. It actually curves up a bit. And the reason it curves up a bit is because we've distorted the surface of the Earth with this map. Lengths have changed. And so how do we make this careful uh, mathematically? All right. So by the way, if uh, any point you get intimidated by the mathematics, just try to understand the qualitative stuff. And it, but even try to understand the mathematics qualitatively. Here's your rule of Pythagoras on a sphere. This is your uh, lines of latitude. Your latitude is given by this uh, angle theta here. Your longitude is given by uh, this uh, coordinate here. Phi is the longitude. And if you look over here, see how uh, lengths are get distorted? The way to understand that is that ds squared does not equal d theta squared plus d phi squared. It's not, it's not, in other words, c squared does not equal a squared plus b squared as in the rule of Pythagoras. You have to put in a factor here, some function that help, tells you how lengths have gotten distorted as a function of where you are on the map. So it doesn't really matter what this is, by the way. Most, unless you're really, really good at geometry, you probably couldn't compute this in your head. But anyway, that's how things get distorted. And so here's your triangle. D phi squared plus D theta squared is not what equals DS squared. It's D theta squared plus D phi squared times cosine squared theta. That tells you what DS squared is for each vector. Now, why do I care what the length of a, of a velocity vector is? Well, if I want to compute the length of this green curve, I integrate the length of its velocity. Right? If you take the integral of its speed, that tells you how far you've gone. The speed is just the length of, its, of all the velocity vectors. So this raises a question, though. If we recognize this as the geometry of a two-sphere, a two-dimensional sphere, what other geometries might there be? So here's an example of some. That's just, so this is your usual rule of Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Right? I've just used this fancy complicated notation, ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared, but that's basically the rule of Pythagoras. That gives you flat geometry like the ancient Greeks studied. If you then uh, distort it and put in a factor here, that gives you this, the geometry of the sphere of radius 1. If you put in some more terms, you get the geometry of the sphere of radius r. If you put in an even more complicated term called the hyperbolic sign here, that gives you hyperbolic space. It's a space uh, that uh, Gauss was the first to realize understood that has constant negative curvature. And then here's another way to, uh, if you take your usual rule of Pythagoras but then divide through by y squared, that gives you something called uh, hyperbolic space as well. So this raises the question, well, what are all possible geometries? Well, that's a really tough question. I spend my life trying to understand that to some extent, as do many other mathematicians. But let's just start with some of the basic geometries. What if we take the rule of Pythagoras and we just put a 4 in front of the dx squared and a 9 in front of the dy squared? I just are, I pick some constants, like 4 and 9. What you find out is that you can uh, group terms. That's like having 2dx squared plus 3dy squared. And if you do a substitution, like ca capital X equal little 2, 2 times little x, then this becomes the rule of Pythagoras again, just where you've changed variables. So, the key point I'm trying to highlight here is that if you just have constant coefficients in front of your rule of Pythagoras, you just get back your original rule of Pythagoras after you've distorted, stretched the x and y directions by a certain amount. So for example, in other words, these constant coefficient metric changes, all they do is take your piece of paper and stretch it by a factor of 2 one way and stretch it by a factor of 3 the other way. 
it's distorted, but essentially it's the same geometry that the ancient Greeks were studying. So it's not too interesting. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Okay, what about uh, if we're in four-dimensional uh, space and I just put some constants A, B, C, and D there? Um, do I get anything new? And the answer is it depends. Because if they're all positive, then I can do the same trick I've done before and you just get back to four-dimensional Euclidean space. But if three of them are positive and one of them is negative, like this example here, then when you group the terms, something different happens. You all heard the fact that a negative times a negative equals a positive? Well, the point is, is that there is no square root of minus 25. 5 times 5 equals 25, but also minus 5 times minus 5 equals 25. So when you have a minus 25 there, there's no way to make this plus something squared. It has to be minus something squared. And so when you do the change of variables, you've, yeah, you've stretched x by a factor of 2, y by a factor of 3, and z by a factor of 4, but your t here, it's got stretched by a factor of 5, but you're left with the minus sign. So in terms of what are the basic geometries one might study coming from a point of view of Gauss and Riemann, the point is it's either going to be something with all uh, positives uh, like Euclidean space or it might have some positives and some negatives. And so this is actually a basic geometry. So now what I want to do is let's try to understand what the geometry of this space is. And I've already told you this unifies space and time. X, Y, and Z are spatial and T is time. Okay, so look right here. This is our metric. This is our rule of Pythagoras where we have x, y, z, and t, but t has a minus sign in front. And that's our axiom. All right, that's what we're assuming describes how you compute lengths. So for example, if, what's the length of this blue vector here? Or what's the length of this red vector there? Well, you look at its components, plug in there, and it tells you what ds squared is. Now here's the only thing that's weird about this. We call this the length of the vector squared, ds squared, but this could be negative, right? We have something positive, positive, positive. You're subtracting something positive. This ds squared could be negative. So there's two kinds of vectors. There's vectors where ds squared is positive. We call those space-like vectors because they're pointing more in the x, y, and z directions than in the t direction. Or you could have vectors where, like the red one, where ds squared is negative. We call those future time-like vectors. Or you could have vectors where the vector is, it's not zero, but the ds squared, the length of the vector squared is zero. So in other words, you can have vectors that aren't zero, that have zero length, okay? When you have to introduce a minus sign into your rule of Pythagoras. So this is very counterintuitive to us, but it's simply because we've changed our axioms. Okay, so we have three types of vectors, space-like, time-like, and, and null vectors. And what's neat is this green cone, see I've, I've, there's a cone here, it's like an ice cream cone, right? But, or a snow cone, and it goes up and down. That acts as the barrier between time-like vectors, which point up and down, and space-like vectors which point out. Now notice the space-like vectors are all connected. You, got, you can rotate a space-like vector all the way around and space-like vectors are all connected. But time-like vectors are split into two different components. Those that are pointing up, which are called future time-like vectors, and those that are pointing mostly down, which are called past time-like vectors. And so this geometry already gives you a notion, a difference between the notion of future and the notion of past as well. <clears throat> so, now that we have this geometry of x, y, z, and t space called the Minkowski space-time, the principle that we're going to follow is that geometric quantities, like what's the length of this curve, correspond to physical observables. So for example, we all have a world line. Okay? So what's my world line? Well, this might be my world line. Here, let, let me now uh, re, uh, show you how I would have this world line. Okay? So first I'm standing, standing here, and then it looks like I move over here, and then I move back over there, and then I move back over here. The whole point is, I'm not just moving in x, y, and z, I'm also, t is increasing all the time. So as t increases, as I move around, x, y, as my x, y, and z locations move around, as t increases, that traces out a world line. So a particle, for example, is not a point in, sp in space-time, it's actually a curve in space-time, because it's not just the particle now, it's the particle at all times. And so all particles trace out a path in, uh, in space-time, which is kind of how we're intuitive, because we think of ourselves as like, like we're one point, we're like, I'm right here, right? But I'm not just here now, I'm somewhere else later on, and then somewhere else after that. Okay, so one way, uh, here's uh, one simplification we can do, is we can just remove the y and z vectors, then uh, if we do that, then uh, it simplifies the picture a bit. What we're going to do is, we, if I go back one, you can see that 
we have x, y, and z. I mean, I, I'm having trouble with too many dimensions. How do you write something that's four-dimensional? It's hard to do. So what I'm doing now is let's just ignore the y and the z for the second, and let's just, let's just go ahead and have x there, t there, and the y and the z, they're pointing out off here somewhere, but let's just ignore them. And then we still have the fact that you've got future time-like vectors, past time-like vectors, space-like vectors, and then null vectors in green. And so really you have this point, a, a, a light cone that's a, a light x. So here's the question I want to uh, ask you now, is in this new geometry, what's a rotation? So let's start with what we know. Look at the red curve here, the blue curve, and the green curve. If I said rotate that, just take it and then rigidly rotate it like 30 degrees or something, then you would get what I've, I've dashed. The blue curve, the blue vector, gets rotated to the dashed blue vector. The green vector gets rotated to the dashed green vector. And the red vector gets rotated to the dashed red vector. However, when, that's when you're using regular x, y coordinates with uh, Euclidean geometry, as the ancient Greeks did. That's what we think of as intuitive, right? That made sense. Here is, it just so happens, when you put that minus sign and the way you measure distances, rotations change. They're not what we think of as intuitive anymore. So when I say take this red, green, and blue vectors, and this is completely analogous to this picture here. And if I say rotate them 30 degrees up, well, sure enough, the blue vector rotates this way. But that same rotation, but notice it also got longer. So from our point of view, here the lengths stay the same. Here it actually got a little bit longer. Also, when I rotate this vector, uh, it goes to this dashed vector. The red one, instead of coming over here, as you would expect, actually rotates the opposite direction. And the green vector actually gets, doesn't even change its direction. When you rotate, it just gets longer. All right, that's what a rotation looks like. And there's a, a lot of mathematics behind this. And so I, I gave an example here, which, you know, let's not get into the details of this right now. I kind of feel like um, this would be good for reviewing later for those of you who want to. But the reason, uh, just to kind of give the overview, is that if, you, if I look at these initial vectors, and this is one's 13 comma 0, 13 comma 13, and 0 comma 13, when you rotate them, what rotations do is they preserve the dot product. You may have heard of that from your high school class, or if you're not in high school yet, you'll hear about it at some point. When you take the dot product of two vectors, you get this dot product this way. What rotations have is that they preserve the dot product between corresponding vectors. So for example, the red dot, the blue here, they have zero dot product. And so when you rotate them, they'll still have zero dot product. And so you can use the fact that the dot product is preserved and as a definition. Again, we're going back to the axioms. What is a rotation? Definition, a rotation is a, tr a linear transformation of the space which preserves the dot product. When you have the usual dot product here, you get stuff that's intuitive. When you put a minus sign in your dot product, which comes from putting a minus sign in front of the dt squared, then uh, the formulas for what rotation is change, and this is what you get, OK? So uh, for example, this, let me just give you one quick example. What's the, what's the dot product of the green vector with itself? Well, when you plug in, and, or for example, what is ds squared of this green vector? Well, it's 12 squared minus 12 squared. Because that minus sign, you get 144 minus 144, which is 0. Rotations preserve the lengths of vectors. So if this green vector starts out with a, a zero length, when you rotate it, it still has to have a zero length. But the only way to have a zero length is to stay on this you know, t equal x line. And so then it gets rotated to this vector there. So anyway, I'll um, put this. This will be on the, on, on the file on the, uh, on the web page so people can study this more if they want to when they have more time. What's interesting then is because of the way things transform, let's consider this scenario. Imagine you have three different particles, one moving along the path A, one moving along the path B, and one moving along the path L here. Now, the, notice this is T. And so what does this represent? The person that, or the particle represented by the, part, by, the, by the red curve A would be like if I just stood right here and I didn't move. Then at T equals 0, I'm right here. And as long as I don't move, then I'm right there. But if I want to follow the particle on path B, what I have to do is I have to walk across the room at speed 5 thirteenths. And if I do that, then I'm tracing out the path on part, on, traced out by the vector B. On the other hand, if I want to trace out the path given by the, the green vector, I have to walk even faster. I have to walk with speed 1 across the room. And now I'm tracing out as, as t increases, x is increasing with speed 1. Okay? So 
how fast does it look like the um, uh, particle following path B is going according to A? Well, notice that when T, when, uh, T increases by <coughs> 13, the X increases by 5, so it seems like the velocity of particle B here is 5 thirteenths. Anyone standing and not moving would say, well, I'm not moving at all, and that other person is moving with speed 5 thirteenths. And this green curve is moving with speed 1. So what I mean here is that the person represented by A, from their point of view, B has a velocity 5 thirteenths, and L has a velocity 1. But now I want to ask another question. What velocity does the person on particle, uh, represented by particle B uh, think that A and L are following? <clears throat> Well, if A sees B has velocity 5 thirteenths, then it's reasonable to think by symmetry B must think that A is going the other way with speed 5 thirteenths. That's a good guess. Now, but what, is, what does B think the velocity of L is? And that's not quite so obvious. So the way we handle that is we do a rotation of that whole situation. You take uh, your original situation and, and do a boost. And when you do that, um, remember rotations here cause uh, boosts that look like that. Let's see, I missed a picture here. Okay, so when you take this picture here and now do a rotation. Now why would I want to do a rotation? A rotation preserves the geometry. It preserves ds squared. And so <clears throat> we'll make an assumption that when you do a rigid motion like a rotation, you're not actually changing any physical observable, any true geometric quantity. So when you do a rotation, you'll see what, so what happened there. I do a rotation, this curve is going to curve that way, and A gets stuck out this way. So this is a, a rigid motion, a rotation. Now I have B not moving at all. So we can say from the point of view of B, B is not moving, but now we see that A has velocity minus 5 thirteenths. But when you do this rotation, notice that the, the, the green curve is still pointing in the same direction, just, just shorter. And so in particular, it still has speed 1. So here's the, the key point, is that if you have something moving along the t equal x line, it has 0 ds squared, so whenever you do a rotation, it will still have to stay on that line so as to still have 0 ds squared. So the bottom line then is that both A and B, no matter what their velocities are, they both observe L has velocity 1. If you ask A, A will say L has velocity 1. If you ask B, B will say L has velocity 1. Okay. So I'm going through some pretty deep mathematics here. If it seems hard, it's because it is hard. But we have seen something very fundamental here. And that is that with this weird geometry, where you just put in a minus sign. We just took the rule of Pythagoras and put in a minus sign. Changed the plus sign in front of the dt squared to a minus sign. When you do that, there are certain directions, these uh, speed 1 directions, which everyone observes as going at speed 1. There are certain vectors that have speed 1 according to everyone. Now, why is that important? Well, in 1887, some physicists, Michelson and Morley, tried to measure the speed of light. And they were able to do it. And they, other people had already measured that the speed of light was roughly 186,000 miles per second, or here in Canada, 300,000 kilometers per second. But here's the thing about it. Velocity of the speed of light is, is 300,000 kilometers per second with respect to what? Because if we make an analogy with the speed of sound, <clears throat> the speed of sound is defined with respect to the air molecules. And so what is the speed of light with respect to? If sound is a vibrating, uh, is vibrating air molecules and light is, is something that's vibrating, well, what exactly is vibrating? And so physicists had this idea that there was some background uh, matter call, or substance called the ether. And light was some something vibrating in the ether. And that light would have some special velocity with respect to the ether, which permeated all of space. And what that meant was, is that, well, the Earth is not, it's not stationary. The Earth is moving, actually, quite quickly around the sun. And so depending on what season it was and how you oriented your measurement apparatus in your laboratory, you, based on the motion of the Earth and what season it was, the speed of light should change. If it has a constant velocity with respect to the ether, which is fixed, and the Earth is moving through the ether, then we should measure a slightly different velocity for the speed of light depending on what season it is. And so they tried to measure that, and they measured it over and over and over again, and what they found out is no matter what season it was, or what time of day it was, or which way they turned their apparatus, they always got exactly the same velocity for the speed of light, 300,000 or so kilometers per second. 
This was weird. Didn't make sense to them. Meanwhile, we have this geometry which of, of the rule of Pythagoras with the minus sign that says that there is a velocity which everyone will measure to be speed one no matter how fast you're going. So what this geometry predicts by putting that simple minus sign there is that there will be a velocity that's the same no matter what velocity you're going. <clears throat> and essentially that's because of this picture here that when you do a rotation, this is our normal notion of rotation, but when you do a rotation with uh, this new geometry with the minus sign, the green curves just get pushed in that direction. They have speed one, and when you, you do a rotation, they still have speed one, even from the point of view of a different observer. So now let's talk about the twin paradox, which is a famous um, quote-unquote paradox from special relativity, which actually makes a, a lot of sense. You've probably heard about it before. Let me d d uh, demonstrate with this picture. Imagine, I actually do have a brother, we're not twins, but um, imagine I had a twin. Then imagine uh, I stay here on the planet Earth, and I stay here for 26 years. This is, if I don't, never move, then uh, in 13 years plus 13 more years, it'll be 26 years later. Let's suppose instead my twin brother gets on a spaceship and moves with this velocity, 5 thirteenths, for uh, a certain period of time here, for 13 years, according to my perspective and then stops and then comes back to Earth along this vector. The key point is that uh, the amount of time that, that I experience is the length of my curve. I experience the length of this curve. My twin brother experiences the length of that curve. Now why is that? Well, that's another axiom. Is that, well, I have a world line. That's my world line. That's my twin brother's world line. The le they have a length. These curves have a length. And one of the axioms is that any geometric quantity, any observable, like a geometric quantity, should be an observable, right? Geometry equals observables. Geometry equals physics. So that length of my curve should be something. And the most natural thing to say it is, is how much time I ex experience. Now, you probably were willing to believe that I would experience 26 years because I go from 0, 0 to 0, 26. T is increased by 26. So I'm probably not um, telling you anything you wouldn't already believe that I would experience 26 years of time on my watch. But what's surprising is that the length of this curve, because it's by the rule of Pythagoras, it's only 12 here and 12 there, it's actually shorter. Why is it only 12? Because it's not, five square, it's not 13 squared plus 5 squared, it's 13 squared minus 5 squared. And then you take a square root. And so this is actually has length 24 total. So I experienced 26 years, my twin experiences 24 years. So he goes off and comes back and now he's two years younger than I am. <laughs> all right, that's the so-called twin paradox. But it's not a paradox at all. It just goes against our intuition. It's just that when you put a minus sign in the rule of Pythagoras, which is an axiom, then the lengths of curves change in a slightly unexpected way, which means that the amount of time that my twin experiences is less than the time that I experience. Now, on the other hand, imagine another twin of mine. Maybe we're, we're all, I guess, triplets. And he gets on a, a spacecraft that goes close to the speed of light and does that for this uh, curve of 13 years from my perspective, and then turns around and comes home at close to the speed of light, he would have experienced something very close to zero time. And so 26 years later, this young person shows up, and it's my other, uh, it was my other triplet, and uh, he has only aged maybe one year. And I think you, maybe some of you have seen that movie uh, that came out recently uh, called... Uh, Interstellar. Interstellar, thank you. Right, which actually deals with uh, the fact that different uh, people can experience a different amount of time depending on where you are in the universe. And, and interstellar is because they get close to a black hole, they experience less time. And that's uh, scientifically accurate. It's exactly what uh, we, we know would, to be the case. So now let's talk about more about the geometry of uh, this new space. So over here, this is our normal four-dimensional Euclidean space, something very similar to what the ancient Greeks would have studied. Over here is the Minkowski space-time. It's where we put that minus sign in. I just want to show you the types of things that change in terms of the basic geometry. Over here, you have something called the sphere of radius r. Right? You can say, what are the set of points that are exactly a distance r from the origin? And you get a sphere. You can ask the question, well, what are the set of points that are a distance r from the origin over here as well? And you get different types of answers. And in fact, there are three different types of spheres. You have the set of points that are distance zero away, represented by the green curve. 
you have the set of points where ds squared is negative, represented by the blue curves, and the set of points where ds squared is positive, represented by this rotated um, red hyperbola. Each has very natural geometry. <clears throat> And in fact, this, these blue curves all have the uh, geometry of hyperbolic space. So for the mathematicians in the audience, these spaces here are very natural. They're spaces of constant negative curvature. And they're kind of the opposite of a sphere, which is a space of constant positive curvature. So actually, in fact, if you ask me as a mathematician, what is hyperbolic space? For those of you who are mathematicians, that's what hyperbolic space is. I mean, if you ask me what's the spherical metric, I would say the spherical metric is most naturally viewed as a sub... As, as a sphere inside of a Euclidean space. And hyperbolic space is most easily viewed as the, a sphere inside of Minkowski space. Another question is, what is this red curve here? If I just look at this red curve here. And that is a very interesting question. What does this red curve represent? Well, it's completely analogous to a circle. Whereas you would have a circle in Euclidean space, this has um, constant curvature as well. So in Euclidean space, a circle has constant curvature. In Minkowski space, this red curve has constant curvature, which physically manifests itself as constant acceleration. In other words, if I were to follow this red curve, this is what it would feel like to me. It would, I would feel like I was doing constant acceleration in this way. Okay? So I would start out with uh, low velocity, and my velocity would increase as I went this way with the constant acceleration. Now you've all heard about the fact that you can't go faster than the speed of light, and that's true. So how can I keep on accelerating that way if I'm not allowed to go faster than the speed of light? Eventually I'd hit that speed limit. And this shows how you're going to hit that speed limit. You start to accelerate, but notice that my velocity never, my speed never gets past speed one. I become sort of tangent to the green curve, but I can't ever um, go faster than the green curve. I can't ever go like this, for example. <clears throat> And in fact, if you want to know how far am I going to go as a function of time that I experience, it's given by these formulas here. This uh, hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine actually parameterizes this hyperbola. This red curve is actually a hyperbola. And this is all stuff that you can learn in, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, hyperbolas are something you learn a little bit about in high school. And then in college, when you take some more classes, you can learn a little bit more about it. But hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sines are nice ways to parameterized hyperbolas. And so the bottom line is, is that the distance you can travel, d, as a function of how much time you experience, s, is given by this formula where a is your acceleration. Now let me just bottom line it for you, okay? We don't have to go through all the exact details, but you know, this works out reasonably straightforwardly. So we can now answer the following important question, which I know you're all wondering about. If, when you were departing uh, these lectures today, you were abducted by aliens, how far could they take you away from the planet Earth in your lifetime? It's a pretty interesting question, isn't it? Right now, you're, you're spending your whole life assuming that you would never see anything, right? Who knows, right? We don't have the technology on the planet Earth to, to take you to some distant part of the galaxy, but maybe some aliens do. Now, for, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, we haven't ever encountered aliens like this before, so it's not very likely anyone's going to be abducted, but it's an interesting question. It's the type of question that mathematicians and physicists like to think about. So I'm gonna, let me ask you to seriously think about this question. I mean, seriously, I'm gonna, you know, I'll take a survey here in a second. If you were abducted by aliens after this lecture, how far away from Earth could they take you in your lifetime? Let me give you some uh, basic data about how big the universe is. So this is representing our Milky Way galaxy. So the next closest star to us, uh, Proxima Centauri, is about four light years away. So let me explain what that means. It means that it takes light four years to get there. Okay. So even if you could go to the speed of light, it would take you four years to get there. Now let me point something out. If aliens were, put me in their spaceship, and then accelerated to the speed of light in an instant, they had turned me into goo. Right? There's no way the human body can, ex can withstand uh, that kind of acceleration. Right? There's a limit to how fast you can accelerate someone without killing them. So, and even if you could go the speed of light, the next closest star is still four light years away. Now the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So even if you could get going the speed of light, 
it would still take you 100,000 years uh, to get from one side to the other. Really amazing how big the universe is. And let me just throw out there, by the way, the Milky Way is only one of about uh, 100 billion galaxies in the known universe. And yet, look how big it is, 100,000 light years across. The next closest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, is about two and a half million light years away. And the edge of the observable uni universe is around 45 billion light years away. Okay, so which, if any of these things, do you think it would be realistic for the aliens to take you to before in your lifetime? How far away could they take you? Okay, well, this formula here by constant acceleration, gosh, I'm having trouble going the right way all the time. Okay, so if, you know, how far could they take you? Well, I mean, assuming a human lifespan is less than 100 years, typically, then, you know, certainly they could not take you more than 100 light years from the planet Earth, even if you could get going at the speed of light, in my lifetime. But that's not really the question, is it? Sure, you can't go more than 100 light years from Earth in my lifetime. But if you're abducted, the real question is, how far could they take you from the planet Earth in your lifetime? It's a different question, because remember, time goes more slowly for the abducted person than for the person, people that stay here on Earth. So there's an interesting uh, factoid um, that, you know, if, and I, uh, this is a fun exercise I did as a graduate student, but if I were abducted by aliens, I would want them to accelerate me at 9.8 meters per second squared, which is 1 g. Imagine a spacecraft that accelerated at 1 g, exactly 1 g. Then I would experience gravity in my entire trip, and that would be very pleasant. So that would be like the Royals Royce of spaceship, would be a spaceship that could accelerate at 1 g for as long as I like. The question is, now if you accelerate at 10 g, I'd die for sure. 2 or 3 g might be rather unhealthy. Right? 1 g, though, we know that's comfortable because that's what we're doing right now. 1 g is great. So here's an interesting factoid. If you accelerate at 1 g for one year, you'll be going close to the speed of light. 1 g times one year equals roughly the speed of light. It's kind of an interesting coincidence. And so if you plug that into our formulas then, you get the following results. That if you were to accelerate at 1 g for, let's say, three years, you could go nine light years. If you did it for four years, you'd go 25 light years. Five years, 75 light years. Notice how it tripled there? It's like tripling. Three times three is nine. Three times nine is 27. You know, we'll call it 25, 25 times 3 is 75, is growing exponentially. And this is something that's different from Newtonian physics, something that uh, you get in Minkowski space times, is that the distance you travel actually goes up exponentially, actually triples every time you add a year, because the formula has a hyperbolic cosine in it, which actually grows exponentially. And so, in fact, for, if you were to accelerate 1g for 25 years, you could go 35 billion light years in any, any direction you wanted. So in particular, if uh, they abducted you, how far away from Earth could aliens take you in your lifetime? Practically anywhere if you eat right and exercise. <laughs> However, um, it would, you know, all you got to do is do 25 years to accelerate, 25 years to deaccelerate, and then you would uh, be at rest uh, roughly 72 billion light years from the planet Earth. Only one little sad thing, meanwhile, 72 billion years have passed on the planet Earth. <laughs> and that's the whole twin paradox. My, what's 72 billion years from my perspective is only 50 years from your perspective because you were going close to the speed of light. So one thing that's pretty neat about that is that that means time machines exist. You know, do time machines exist? Well, yeah. Here, I'm going to go five seconds into the future. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. I'm here. Right? We're all going forward in time all the time. But, okay, that was kind of stupid. But could I go a million years into the future? And the answer is, uh, yeah, we've got just one little engineering problem. We need a, we need a spaceship that will accelerate at 1G indefinitely. Right? So this is like the Space Shuttle Columbia, except not just for a few seconds, right? A few minutes getting into, I need to go for like years. Right? I mean, do, can we engineer something like that? Well, right now it's beyond our current... Um, you know, reasonable expectations, but who knows what technology might exist in the future. And so now we have a, a, a question then is, well, if just putting a minus sign in that part of the formula, all we did was put a minus sign in the rule of Pythagoras, 
and we got all we got special relativity, which unifies, unifies space and time. You know, what about other metrics? And this is a question that Einstein asked. You know, what about instead of just putting a minus sign in front of the rule of Pythagoras, what if we put a minus sign and then a function of x, y, and z and t, and then another function of x, y, and z and t in front of the x, y, and z terms? Uh, what kind of geometries uh, do you get? And so what we're doing is we're removing the assumption that the geometry of the universe is flat. And if you think about it, why not? Why can't the universe be curved? And so Einstein asked that question. And it, it turns out that uh, the universe is not flat. In fact, it is curved. And this is what I've just described to you, by the way, is special relativity. And now getting rid of that's the introduction of that minus sign is special relativity. And then even going further and saying that the metric could be anything, that's general relativity. And the basic idea of general relativity is now that you're going to, now that we've unified space and time, and by the way, that minus sign in the rule of Pythagoras is something that's experimentally verified. So when you do experiments, um, physicists do all kinds of experiments uh, that have verified special relativity. Space and time, in fact, are unified that way. <clears throat> and then this whole idea of looking at even more general rules of Pythagoras, which we call metrics, raises the question of if you have some sort of curved space, like the surface of the Earth, this curve, or any other curved surface, what does the curvature of the universe represent? And Einstein's idea, which he called his happiest thought, can be summarized in three words. General relativity can be summarized in three words. Matter, curves, spacetime. So this whole x, y, z, t thing we call spacetime, it's usually flat when there's vacuum, but when you have matter like the sun or the earth or a moon, then they curve it. <clears throat> so what, is that, what does that mean exactly? What it means is that if you have um, like the, the sun here, for example, suppose the sun is uh, a, a very massive object. If the sun is curving uh, spacetime, then the reason that the Earth, for example, goes around the sun is because spacetime itself is being curved by the sun. And if you run the numbers and say, OK, matter curves spacetime, that idea, of course, requires a lot of mathematics. And in fact, Einstein himself had that idea for years before he could, turn, he could find the right mathematical equation to describe the idea that matter curves spacetime. But when he finally figured it out, and he came up with the Einstein equation, he um, plugged it in, and then he started looking at the orbits of the planets. And he realized that the, this idea that matter curves spacetime predicts gravity. And it gives an alternate view to what Newton said. Newton said that gravity was a 1 over r squared force law. Einstein said there is no force of gravity. It's just that matter curves spacetime. And the curvature of spacetime is what causes it to look like planets are going around massive objects like the sun. And in fact, in the 1850s, Astronomers had already realized that Mercury was not doing what Newton said it should be doing. The orbit of Mercury was already not following the laws of physics according to Newton. And so Einstein was aware of this, and so he said, I wonder if my new theory, which says that matter curves spacetime, I wonder if that would correctly explain the orbit of Mercury. And he looked at the numbers, and he crunched the numbers, and he found out that it did. And in fact, Mercury goes around the sun in an elliptical orbit, slightly elliptical orbit, but because of the interactions of other planets, that ellipse uh, precesses. In other words, its, access ro its uh, axis rotates. You know, the one was like this, and then it's like that, and then it's like this. And the precession, the movement of that axis, uh, can be measured. Newtonian physics pre predicts this precession of 1.5436 per century, not what's observed, which is 1.5556 per century degrees. And like I said, that was observed in 1859. The first thing Einstein did when he came up with his new theory of general relativity was to see that, sure enough, general relativity gives you exactly the right answer. What else does general relativity do? Predicts black holes. Now, Einstein realized that general relativity predicts black holes. But when he saw that, he uh, said, oh, well, it would never happen. I mean, even Einstein thought that was just too crazy an idea of the existence of a black hole. A black hole being something that's so massive, even light can't escape. So Einstein thought, OK. I mean, he didn't want to be called ridiculous. And his uh, theory was predicting something ridiculous, namely a black hole. And so he's like, OK, well, that would never happen. He made excuses for his theory predicting something so bold. 
Now, uh, black holes have been observed since about 1970. And in fact, the center of the Milky Way galaxy has a black hole that's roughly four million times the mass of the sun. And uh, recently in the news, I heard some report that there was a black hole that was so many billion times the mass of the sun. And I haven't had a chance to look in the details of that, but that's really quite remarkable. Uh, so black holes can, are ac actually expected to be at the center of most uh, big galaxies, if not all big galaxies. Now that they are black, so that makes it really hard to see. So this is a picture of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It's that black thing right there. Now you can't really see it. <laughs> All right. Um, but the reason they know it's there is that there are these stars that come in. They're you know, very massive, right? As big as our sun and bigger. And then they get just whipped around by something at this certain point, just like they're nothing. Like they're, and so something has massive gravity right there. And based on that, they realize there must be a black hole there. Another thing that general relativity predicts is the curvature of light around the sun. And this is a bold prediction. And so in 1919, uh, Eddington went out and on an island off the west coast of Africa during a solar eclipse, he looked at starlight and he saw that the stars wobbled exactly the amount as predicted by general relativity. And that this represented the curvature of light around the sun. Now, Newtonian physics could be said to predict curvature of light around the sun, too, if you wanted to. I mean, you could say maybe light has epsilon mass and takes some limits and so forth. But even if you do that, it turns out they make different predictions. They're off by a factor of two. And uh, general relativity gets it right, and Newtonian physics is off by a factor of two. Interestingly enough, Einstein's the only scientist to ever receive a ticker tape parade in New York City, which I think is pretty awesome. But I do think it's just funny to look how polite and, and circumspect everyone is. Um, here compared to when they won the Super Bowl, right? So, <laughs> another thing that general relativity predicts, and this is really deep, and this is almost uh, what do you call it, philosophical, or is this type of stuff to make us think about our existence and why are we here and things like that? I mean, this is amazing. General relativity predicts the beginning of everything. If you plug into the equations of general relativity and make a few assumptions, like the universe is roughly homogeneous, that it's roughly the same everywhere, right? So it's called um, being homogeneous and isotropic. Every point in every direction is the same. Make a few simple assumptions like that, plug into the equations, it predicts a big bang. It predicts that there was a beginning to the universe. Either that or that there's a big crunch coming up in the future. One of the two, that's, you know. <laughs> and it turns out that they, uh, you know, that, that, by the way, that was realized by uh, Friedman, a, a Russian mathematician, before Hubble measured the actual expansion of the universe. So um, this is uh, Hubble, who actually, uh, through his uh, uh, telescope, saw that the universe was expanding. And then here are two of the um, uh, uh, first people who actually discovered mathematically that the universe, that general relativity predicts a Big Bang in an expanding universe, actually before Hubble. And so we have a Big Bang and an expanding universe. And here's what's uh, really amazing. You may have heard about this. Is, this is, by the way, not just in our lifetimes. This is the last uh, you know, 15 years or so. Last 15 years or so. What uh, astrophysicists or what astronomers realize is the universe just isn't, isn't just expanding. But there was a Big Bang. And due to gravity, with after the Big Bang, you would think that it would, gravity would slow things down. You have a Big Bang, but then things would slow down. Maybe they would even recollapse, you'd have a big crunch. But in fact, what they found was it had escape velocity. The Big Bang was, massive, so it was powerful enough that it's expanding and it has escape velocity. But still, it should be slowing down because of gravity. But that's not what they've observed. They've observed that, sure enough, there was a Big Bang. It was slowing down for the first 10 billion years of the lifetime of the, after the Big Bang. And for the last few billion years, it's been accelerating. The expansion, it slowed down, and now it's starting to take off and growing uh, uh, faster, going faster and faster. And that accelerating expansion of the universe is really something quite dramatic. I mean, what could be causing the entire universe to be accelerating away from uh, everything else in the universe? So uh, 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the discovery, and it's well-deserved, but I want to point out that General relativity also made this prediction. Uh, that all you have to do is introduce a cosmological constant in general relativity, which Einstein played around with quite famously. And that explains the accelerating expansion of the universe. Interesting historical fact is when Einstein introduced a cosmological constant, 
He didn't know that the universe's expansion was accelerating, so he considered it his greatest mistake of his career. Turns out, other people won a Nobel Prize for his greatest mistake. <laughs> so let's do a quick inventory of the mass of the universe. The um, universe is, uh, in fact, that accelerating expansion of the universe is caused by a cosmological constant from general relativity. And that, uh, if you think of that as, as matter, actually represents 70% um, of the mass of the universe. And then 25% of the mass of the universe is dark matter. That's most of the mass of galaxies. It's invisible, but you can tell it's there because of its, of its gravity. And only 5% of the mass of the universe today is made up by hydrogen and helium and lithium, carbon and oxygen and the other elements of the periodic table. So when you look out in the universe and look at in terms of gravity and the, um, based on gravity, this table and everything in this room is actually not what makes up most of the universe in terms of mass. So we're at a very interesting time in history where we basically don't really understand 95% of the mass of the universe. <laughs> so in other words, the story is not over yet. We've had a, a great success. I've explained special relativity to you where you just put a minus sign and in in, uh, change the geometry of the rule of Pythagoras and you get special relativity. And then general relativity is where you consider even more interesting ways of doing uh, the rule of Pythagoras. And then you get general relativity. But the story is not over. The question is, you know, for example, what is this dark matter? And that's uh, uh, something uh, that if you look in galaxies, most of the mass of galaxies is dark matter. And so one conjecture that I've had is that if you want to understand these beautiful spiral patterns in galaxies, you've got to understand the true nature of dark matter. And so that's some of my, my research, is looking at spiral patterns in galaxies and asking the question, well, if we, it's pretty much an experimental fact that most of the mass of galaxies is, is this invisible thing that physicists call dark matter. The correct model of dark matter, can that possibly explain these beautiful spiral uh, images we see uh, in galaxies? And um, so, um, my research has focused on a very natural geometric model of dark matter, which uh, comes out um, geometrically. And I'll just uh, show you some, some pictures of simulations I've done, and then we'll call it a day. There's all kinds of cool pictures here. But here's a simulation of uh, a spiral galaxy that I've done over here. This is a photo of an actual galaxy. And here's another simulation that I've done. There's a photo of an actual galaxy and another simulation in a, compared with a photo, and a simulation compared with a photo. So I think that what these simulations show is that there's good evidence that the same idea that if you want to, understand, if you want to get special relativity, then really it's the rule of Pythagoras. It's basic geometry, but with a minus sign. If you want to get general relativity, it's just that matter curve space-time. And some very fundamental geometric principles also can predict uh, dark matter and get interesting spiral patterns as well. So that's uh, what I'm currently working on. Anyway, thank you all for your attention. Appreciate it. All right, so here's what I'd like to do. With there, there are people. I think we're hearing some kids outside that are looking forward to enter and, mm -hmm. and get to the second part. So maybe uh, let's uh, entertain just a few questions if uh, if you have any for a couple of minutes, and then uh, we'll we'll pause. And, and uh, some of you uh, by that time might want to, to get uh, Trevor the Time Traveler, purchase the book outside if you, if you uh, so desire. But uh, any questions right now? So just uh, intuitively speaking, this placement of, of this negative in terms of a, a narrative, was it, you, okay, let's put a negative here and see if it works out? Or was there some kind of pre-thought? That's a great question. So the question is, we have this rule of Pythagoras, right? And then we just put a minus sign there, right? Well, that's not what really happened historically. Let me, let me say what happened historically first of all, and then, but, and then I'll uh, comment further. Historically what happened was that no one ever thought to put that minus sign there. Everyone kept the plus sign in the rule of Pythagoras because it was just too radical an idea. Such a simple idea, but too radical, right? We're like, oh, why would you do that? It seems kind of silly, right? But then this genius came along, his name was Einstein, and he just kind of intuited the minus sign. All right, it's hard to describe exactly what he did, but if you read his original writings, it essentially intuited the minus sign. 
Then his math professor, who was named uh, uh, Minkowski, said, oh, I see what you're doing. You just put a minus sign in the rule of Pythagoras. And so really, his math professor, that's why we call it the Minkowski space time now, is because um, Minkowski was the first one to realize, oh, I see what you're doing, Einstein. You just put a minus sign in, in uh, you change the plus sign to a minus sign in the rule of Pythagoras. But um, that's not really how Einstein was thinking of initially, but Einstein immediately realized that, yeah, okay, you're right, that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, so Einstein, of course, was a physicist. He was thinking for physical reasons, I need the speed of light to be constant, right? And so he was very familiar with the Michelson-Morley experiment. And so he kind of worked backwards and figured out you needed the minus sign. So that's what happened historically, right? I mean, it was a real genius to be able to do that. What I'd like to point out is it didn't have to happen that way. Mathematicians do all kinds of crazy things. Some things a lot crazier than just putting a minus sign in the rule of Pythagoras, <laughs> right? And that's good. We're always, I consider myself a mathematician. We explore ideas. We say, I don't know, well, what if we do this? Or what about this? We just ask the question. Uh, just to ask the question, why did you climb that mountain? Because it was there. Why did you solve that math problem? Because it was there, right? And so this, this idea was just, it was just right there, right for the picking. Unfortunately, no mathematician saw it first, right? Einstein won by trying to match it up to data and observations, but it was there. And in retrospect, we can rewrite history, and the nice way to think about it is to say, oh, you just take a plus sign and change it to a minus sign. But of course, a tremendous amount of energy and thought. I mean, this is over, I mean, Geniuses, I mean, it's, it's funny how hard it was. I mean, you had to have Einstein, and Minkowski realized what he had done to, to realize, oh, change the plus sign to a minus sign. Because I think this might change my life. I mean, tomorrow I'm going to start putting negative signs everywhere. Well, why not? <laughs> That's what mathematicians do. Let's try this. Let's try that. Maybe a last question? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, on one of your slides, the, uh, the one with the, uh, the boosting, uh, yes. the number three, one of them after the result of the boosting, I think it was the blue one on the bottom right. Okay. Uh, it, it, you can go to it if you want, it's probably not that important. Okay. But, uh, Oops, in, wrong way. in its component for time, it, it had a negative sign there. I'm not totally sure how I feel about things going backwards in time. Oh, okay. I, I think I remember your uh, question here, but it's like this blue line is going down, right? Okay. So, yeah, this is, um, well, this is a space like vector, right? And so, uh, you and I can only follow time-like vectors, so we can follow these red curves here, but we can't follow the blue curves, they're just displacements. So this simply represents something that happened five years ago and 13 light years away. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Good, very, very good question. All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, again uh, thank Professor Bray and... Uh,